Good morning. Um, so I want to talk a little more about it. So you guys saw my son video bomb me. He's got this new blanket. He likes... I don't let him watch it. But his brother introduced him to this Poppy Playtime thing, which is this demonic uh, cartoon. I thought it was this cute thing because he wanted a plushie, so I got him the plushie. I'm like, oh, that's cute. And then he showed me the actual cartoon. It was this demonic, scary... And I said, no, you're not watching that. His 21-year-old brother should know better. But anyway, he got a blanket. And so he was photobombing, video bombing us in that last video. I had to cut it short because he was needing attention but uh anyway for once i did a short video somebody should be proud of me um regarding the mystery of christ uh, uh let me talk more about that so you know i made the dis division of okay the the milk and the meat the milk being the word of the prophets the testimony of god concerning his son now in a way the word, the the prophets, the words of the prophets, G Peter said, they testified, uh, they inquired into the sufferings of the Christ, and the glories to follow. It the sufferings of the Christ are really and the glories to follow. Uh, but the first set of prophecies related to the Lord are related to His death and resurrection, and that's where we get the gospel from. Then there's the second set of prophecies which have yet to be fulfilled, which is him coming to, with his reward to inherit the earth. Uh, you know, we're not going to heaven ultimately. We're coming to earth. The new city Jerusalem comes out from God uh, to a new heavens and a new earth. And when I did that teaching on the new city Jerusalem a couple days ago, I got a couple questions because because I said, look, it's a sign, it's a person, it's not a physical city. People, because people, I used to love it too. Oh, there's a city coming out, um, and it's like a spaceship coming, out, you know. Uh, and I like that view too. And maybe there's a physical counterpart, but the reality of the city is a person, a corporate person, made up of. God, the triune God, and the people he's built himself into, which is the habitation of God in spirit. Uh, and that's the warp of the ages. And if you have a strictly materialistic view of the New Jerusalem, it's amazing how it impacts your view of rewards, service, ministry, uh, what work is, all that. But that city, which is us, will come out from God. And at that time, you know, Jesus is going to deliver the kingdom up to the Father and God will be all in all um, at the end of the millennium. And we will come out from God with God <laughs> uh, to a new heavens and a new earth, which will be purified by fire. Uh, and it'll be a physical universe. And see, what God is doing is he's reconciling all things in heaven and earth um, in Christ. And heading them up in him so with the allegorization of the Bible uh, this is a tangent but in, in like the third century origin was it third century origin was essentially paid I believe by the state to allegorize the kingdom say so the church is the kingdom Israel's promises are spiritual not literal and the reason they did that was so that they could say that the Holy Roman Empire is the kingdom and the representation of the church um and christ is just ruling in your heart so that the believers would submit to the state that's the reason for allegorization um if you do away with the kingdom see this way christ is not coming to destroy the kingdoms of this world he's actually ruling through them uh and they're his representative. Um, there's no conflict with submitting yourself entirely to the Pope and his bishops <laughs> and the state and giving them your money and loyalty. Uh, but um, the, that was it was a political reason why they allegorized the promises to begin with. 
And we're still dealing with it today. All the bad doctrine comes from allegorizing the promises to Israel. And that's where we get new covenant, new heart. Uh, but to, to, to do that, you end up with, well, what is the afterlife? Because if there's no literal kingdom, where are we going? And that's where what they did was they actually borrowed from the pagan views of the afterlife to develop their concepts of heaven. And it's really uh, influenced by the pagan version, you know, like Valhalla and the, uh, the gods. And you especially see it in the Renaissance art, you know, but even before that, the, all the medieval art. But that's all Greek uh, pantheon stuff. It's Babylonian. Uh, and it's basically homage to the previous state of things before the fall of the universe when the angels ruled, uh, way before men. Um, but anyway, they, they make heaven, they, they've, they've taken from the myths of Greco, Greco-Roman mythology and invented heaven. Now, there is a third heaven, which is the throne of God. Uh, and that is, is it a place? Well, p- place, if, you know, time and space are properties of the physical universe. And God exists outside of the physical universe. He is eternal. There's no time with him. And really, space, uh, who knows? You know, size is totally relative. Uh, Where there's no space, you know, there's nothing to define size. There's nothing to define big and small. Uh, And what we have in the you know, great white throne and the book of, uh, revelation of the, the, uh, chapter five and Daniel's vision of the ancient of days. Our visions is something that we can't fully understand. How big is the ancient of days? I mean, you look at the throne and you've got these living creatures and there are millions and millions and billions of people. There's billions of angels around the throne. He says that Uh, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands equates to millions and billions. Um, How big is an angel? Well, in the Bible, they're at least as big as men because they look like men. They're probably bigger. How big are those living creatures? There's four of them surrounding the Ancient of Days. Uh, And yet in front of him on this crystal sea... There are multitudes, and I mean millions of people standing, right? Uh, I'm just I'm just talking about space. How, where would you fit that scene? And how big is the person on the throne if you can see him in full view with all these other people and things around him? We've never seen that number of things gathered together in one place. I mean, you think about like a stadium full of 100,000 people and you're like, wow, that's a lot of people. Okay, multiply that by, uh, I don't know, (laughs) 100 million or something uh, beings. How much space would that take? Would it be the state of Texas? Uh, would it be Australia? You know, and then they're all worshiping before the one who sits on the throne. And just size wise, <laughs> I know this is a silly thing to talk about, but how big is the guy on the throne? You know, it's, it's got to be huge. Uh, but the point is, is that outside of time and space there's 
it's, it becomes totally relative, uh, totally uh, moot point. He can size things as however he wants for scale so that everybody gets a view. You know, is it really about big and small? And when we did Romans, we talked about how the universe declares the glory of the Lord. Um, he uses the physical universe to communicate scale. Uh, you know, his mercy is higher than the heavens. His, uh, you know, his love is deeper than the sea. He's got attributes that he compares to the size of mountains. Uh, and then as far as small, you know, he knows the number of hairs on your head. Consider the lilies. What are these? These are comparisons of scale that without a physical universe, you wouldn't have. What is big and what is small, you wouldn't have a reference. Uh, if we were just a blob of light that had no physical dimensions, if God said, my love for you is vast, we would have no comparison, uh, no means to compare that to anything. Vast? What do you mean vast? Or, you know, my uh, anger was but for a moment, but my kindness for you is everlasting. Well, how long is a moment? <laughs> you know, that it takes a physical universe to communicate some of these things. And God's chosen to reveal himself uh, and communicate himself uh, in the universe so that he could, one of the reasons I believe is so that he could communicate scale. I know what big is because I've seen uh, a boat, a little tiny boat next to a mountain, you know. I know what bigger is because I know the difference between Mount Everest and a foothill. Uh, I know what small is because I know the difference between a basketball and a marble. That, that's physical universe that gives me a sense of scale. And all of it is to communicate his divine attributes and the glory, according to Romans. That... His divine attributes and his glory are clearly seen uh, by the creation. And so he makes all these comparisons through the Bible that help us to sense the scale of his love and his mercy. You know, his thoughts for you, the number, of, if they could be numbered, are as the sands of the seashore. That's you as an individual. What is, what is he thinking about? Well... You're his uh, part of the new creation masterpiece, and he has uh, he loved you with an everlasting love, and he's going to shower the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness to you in the ages to come. And you you're uh, created as part of this masterpiece, which is corporate for good works that he's prepared for you to walk in. And everybody goes, well, that means in my life now. No. It's the ages to come. He's mapped out exploits for the ages to come in which he already has every day mapped out. The day, all the days of your life are in his book. Uh, we go, how could he think so much about me? Because I'm only, I turned 49 this year. <laughs> well, yeah, but predestination is all of his thoughts from eternity to eternity, including all the ages that he's mapped out for me individually uh, as part of the new creation. And then, it, of course, it's Christ and the church. Uh, the thoughts are innumerable. His meditation and his delight on you it goes on and on and on and on. But having a physical universe helps him to communicate his love uh, on, in, in terms of scale. The throne room, is it a place? I, I guess, I mean, the third heavens, it, it seems to be his throne room. It's a place where he can manifest all the positive 
things of who he is in his administration. We don't see other pictures of the third heaven that are not in his throne room, in his presence with his throne. Um, so we say we're going to heaven, you know, uh, and then we make up what that means, you know, we could say, oh, we're going to a new city, the city in the sky, you know, well, no, actually there's a new heavens and a new earth. And that's really talking about a new universe, a purified universe, um, at the end of the thousand years. Which may have a whole new physics. Who knows? You know, uh, there'll be no more sorrow, no more death. No more. I guarantee it'll be beautiful. Uh, but in it, God's intention is to show forth the exceeding riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ, and uh, it'll go on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> the unveiling of Himself will go on and on and on. His We've all, you know, his attributes that he's revealing uh, are unlimited. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ. And we've seen a lot of attributes. The angels saw his power and glory and might and dominion and light and holiness and righteousness, you know. But uh, then he created man and man fell. And then we've got to see his compassion and his love and his mercy and his long-suffering uh even for his enemies you know at everything he did in jesus christ well okay those are the attributes we know how to express and we have language for um that he's demonstrated so far what's next i don't know it won't ever be in the context of suffering again you know but he has an unsearchably rich uh, treasure in himself to reveal forever. It's never going to get boring. And each thing he wants to reveal will take a whole new administration to do it. <laughs> so, uh, buckle up, you know, but he needs a, he, he does, he, he's decided to do it in a universe. And so, no, we're not going to heaven. We're coming to earth. And even when Jesus comes back at the end of the seven-year tribulation, he's coming with us. And we will reign on earth, according to uh, Revelation 5, right? 5.10. Uh, he's made his kings and priests, and we will reign on earth. Um, and the literal uh, Gentiles and the literal Israelites will be situated in literal lands, literal nations, uh, and the literal nations will be set to rebuilding the ruined and desolate places. It's all through Isaiah and other places where I, I believe the first 50 years probably of the millennium will be a, be a time of rebuilding after all the devastation. But there will be no limit uh, to what they can do as far as technologically. Uh, there won't be inequality and politics and obstinate bureaucrats uh, blocking good projects and good ideas because they're trying to pay their rich cronies to, you know, it, it'll be clean energy uh, and who knows, you know, I think it'll be awesome for the mortals and we'll have a part two in helping whatever that'll look like. But then after a thousand years, there's a there's this great white throne moment and then a new heavens and a new earth. Um, but it's it's definitely earth. And, you know, Origen allegorized the Bible and it took 500 years, really, after the Reformation would recover a justification by faith. Well, it took about 300 years for the brethren, really, to bring us back to a literal interpretation of the scriptures in full. To say, look, these promises, without them, you don't have the footstool, you don't have the kingdom, you don't have the Davidic throne, you don't have Jesus coming back. You can't 
say this church is Israel and the uh, you know that's two-thirds of the Bible so the prophetic word this is all I'm just talking for enjoyment <laughs> um, I'm just meditating the prophetic word is the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow and yes that's talking about the death and resurrection of Christ which is our gospel those are the prophets uh, and by believing that we are saved and we call that I call it the milk of the word because it's it's the beginning elementary principles of Christ you know he's the son of God he's God manifested in the flesh he is the Christ and by the way to say that Jesus is the Christ uh, means that you understand that he was appointed to accomplish the work the redemptive work and that he has to be God to do it no other man could do it God had to, only salvation is of God but he accomplished it in his flesh and then rose from the dead to testify that his blood satisfied God. And he has purchased the whole human race uh, so that though everybody who believes that simple message um, can freely come and drink of the water of life. Uh, all they have to do is believe. And he literally purchased the sins of everybody even the people who reject him not because he's a universalist and everybody ends up being forgiven even satan but in order to have the right to execute judgment as the son of man he purchased the whole thing uh it's a righteous purchase you know for him to be able to throw everybody in the lake of fire who doesn't believe he has to have the right to do that he's the owner and he, how do you know he purchased it well he paid the price of blood how do you know that blood was valuable enough to purchase it all? Well, he, it's the blood of the creator, you know, who never sinned and lived a righteous life and gave his life for everybody. And everybody, anybody who believes uh, can have that life. He gave himself. What, what more? He gave his everything he had to buy the field. Uh, if that's not a righteous price, what is? The, if, the, if the one who creates you gives you his own life and says you can have my life forever with all of its uh, wonders as a free gift to refresh and satisfy you forever, and I will pay it for it, uh, I will give it up for you gladly. But if you reject it, well, I've purchased the whole thing and I can do whatever I want with this whole thing. And I'm planning on bringing in my kingdom. Uh, he has the right to do that. And see, that's what Revelation is about. Revelation is not about, strictly, the judgment of the nations first. It is about Christ taking the seals, scroll from the hand of him who sits on the throne, which is the title deed. To the earth, to the land, and to the nations which he inherits. So that he, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of God and of his Christ. And then he comes to displace the enemies so that he can set up his kingdom. It's all positive. It's all about the inheritance. And if you don't see the gospel as a promise of an inheritance, you won't understand the prophetic word except as a message of doom and gloom and fear. You know, yes, justification secured the forgiveness of sins, but God didn't justify us because he was mad at us. He justified us because he loved us. <laughs> uh, people are so confused. We're, you know, we are just confused. We think God is so angry that he sent his son to die for us. <laughs> no. God didn't send the world to con uh, son into the world to condemn it. He sent the son into the world to save it. And that's what the book of Revelation is. It's the salvation. But if you don't understand that, if you don't understand the gospel, you look at it as a book of judgment because there are obviously judgments, plagues. But they're modeled after the plagues of Egypt. Was the plagues of Egypt a judgment or a salvation? Both. It was a judgment against Satan's kingdom, typified by Pharaoh and his armies, 
who had enslaved God's people. But it was a deliverance to God's people who he said, I'm taking out three days journey into the wilderness for a feast. I'm bringing my people into a feast and I'm fulfilling the covenant that I made with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring them into an inheritance that I have secured for them. And I'm going to dispossess the land of its enemies, but that land I've promised to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm fulfilling my word. Well, that's the same thing. And, and he brought his people out with signs following. For them, it was all a confirmation of the glory and power and love of their Redeemer. But for the nations that hardened themselves and tried to uh, not let the people go and persecute them, and they persecuted the Israelites, it was a judgment. And they chose that judgment by hardening their heart. What if Pharaoh had repented? You know, that was an option. He didn't have to have his firstborn die. And he said, well, that's really mean that God killed the firstborn. Yeah, but all Pharaoh had to do was paint the blood on his house of the lamb. And the uh, angel of death would have passed over. And that lamb was God, uh, a picture that God had given his only begotten son to redeem and even have the right to do what he was doing. So God gave his son his only begotten son. Pharaoh didn't give more than God did. <laughs> but anyway, it all comes down to who do you think God is? How do you interpret these things? The prophetic word, you know, the rapture community sees it only as it's going to be hell on earth and you've got to get out of here, which is true. We don't want to be here for that. But as saved believers, we're not going to be here for that. So what's, what are we doing? Well, you have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. And you've been given the spirit as a foretaste, a pledge. You've been sealed with the spirit of promise, who is the pledge guaranteeing the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. What's well, a pledge? It's a foretaste. And that pledge is supposed to be the comforter and your source of strength in this life so that you're not living miserable going, did you just bring us out here to die? Uh, no, that pledge is a foretaste to say, oh, this is the a taste of the goodness of my bridegroom. Oh, how he loves me. How I'm satisfied with him. And to bring you into rest today. Because not only do we have the ages to come to enjoy him, but we are one with him now. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And he said, in that day when I send the spirit, you will know that I am in my father and my father is in me and I in you and you in me and abide in me. And he said, abide in me, little children, or abide in him, little children, so that when he appears, you may have confidence that it's coming and not shrink back in shame. So many will shrink back in shame because they thought the Lord was the hard taskmaster because to them, there was no gospel in the prophetic word. They were barely even on the milk. Okay, but what's the milk and what's the meat? So the milk is the prophetic word which saves us the scripture's testimony, God's testimony concerning the son. He sent his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Okay. Praise God. You're saved. And if you're getting, uh, as the son of, uh, as the Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even must the son of man, but be lifted up whoever would, look or believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life you don't have to know hardly anything about that serpent you can be railing against god saying did you bring us out here to die and getting bit by serpents for your murmuring and complaining in full out rebellion and yet he sets up the serpent on the pole and says just look and anybody who did look at that serpent on the pole in the wilderness was healed even though just minutes ago they'd been railing at god and it doesn't say that they repented for um, 
murmuring against God first. No, they were too busy being bitten and consumed by snakes and dying. But those who had enough something to look up lived. Okay, that's what we have as a model of the milk of the word. The milk saves you gloriously with no work required of you. But then there's the meat. What is the meat? Well, the meat is the discovery of what you've actually received. <laughs> okay. We don't we didn't know anything when we first got saved. I didn't. I mean, I kind of knew some things. I knew a kingdom was coming. Okay. But because I was not fully grounded in the gospel, I still thought God was mad at me. And I thought I had to clean up my this and that uh, in order to be pleasing to him. Uh not realizing that the only way I could be pleasing to him was by presenting myself to him on the altar of his love uh, in the finished work of Christ by faith. That it was the work of Christ that made me acceptable to God, not my work. And that the, the uh, more advanced, you know, like Romans 12 says, uh, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service of worship. Is that milk or meat? Well, I believe it's meat. You want to know why? Because it's based on everything he said in Romans 5 through 8, which is not just the testimony of the prophets about that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, and fulfilled the prophecies and he's coming again and you can by believing that you have eternal life but romans 5 through 6 is the revelation of the mystery which is christ in you the hope of glory and that you were crucified with christ uh and that you were buried with him and baptized bapti baptism into his death and you died to sin and died to the law and you were joined to him uh who was raised from the dead and that he is now the life in you, the spirit of sonship in you, to testify that you are a son and an heir, and that there is no more condemnation, and that no one can be against you, and that God has predestinated you to be conformed to the image of the Son of God, and glorified that he may be the firstborn among many brethren that he shares his inheritance with, and that all things are working together for your good, everything in time and space under the sovereign hand of God is working together for your good, even negative things. Okay. So it's based on all of that vision in Romans six through eight, that Paul says, I beseech you therefore, and, and nine through 11, which is about how God uses everything in time and space for the good of his people. Uh, the, based on all of that, I beseech you therefore, by the mercies of God to present yourself to God as a living sacrifice, which means I'm dead and alive. I'm alive, but I put myself in a position of death. That's what a living sacrifice is. Yeah, I'm alive, but I have to put myself in a position of death and offer myself as a sacrifice, which means I'm not getting up and doing things. No, it's the opposite. I'm crucified with Christ. Uh, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. How am I holy? Because of the work of Christ. How am I acceptable? Because of the fat portion. We've talked about all that. That his fragrance, I'm a fragrance of Christ to God. And I'm pleasing to God because of the person and work of Christ. And I've put him on. And when I come to him, it's in the beloved, my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. And he draws near to me, not because he has to, but because he loves to. That's what this, this is like a burnt offering. I present myself to him, and that's my reasonable service of worship. It's a reasonable service because it's got to do with the renewing of my mind to reason according to the revelation of the mystery. Not just the word of the prophets, but the revelation of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he says, then, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says... Uh, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Well, what is the will of God? Well, I got to do something. He's saying keep the commandments. Saying don't sin. That's what he means is don't sin. No. <laughs> He's saying, for I say to me through the grace given to me, 
that every man which is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. What does it mean to think soberly? It means to think a court not drunk, according to the world, and the vanity and the futility of your mind, influenced by Satan's idea of what God would be like, but according to the word, according to the prophets and the revelation of the mystery. According, and then he says, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. Oh, that means everybody in the world gets a measure of faith, but you can believe in a chair. You can believe in an apple. No, you got to believe in God. No, this is talking about the body of Christ. The measure of faith is in the body of Christ, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, I, if you hold that view, it, it, it's just not. From this, you can't use that verse to say that. Because uh, he says, for as many as we have many members in one body. And all members have not the same offer, office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. What is he talking about? He's still talking about the mystery of Christ. So the first eight chapters are about how Christ satisfied God, and now has come in us to be our, our life, and we are presented to him in the body of his death, uh, in the body of his flesh through death, baptized into his death, made alive together with him, we've received his spirit, and this spirit is his life, and this is to be our life. And it's not a life of law-keeping, it's a life of Christ. Then everything is working together for our good, including bad things, and that's what Romans 8 through uh, 11 is really about. And then Romans 12 is based on all of this. This is the meat of the word. There's a deeper understanding of what Christ has accomplished. Present yourselves to God. To do something? No, to understand. It's a reasonable service, right? And it is a reasonable service of worship, which means it's a burnt offering. A, a worship means I offer something. But what am I offering? Christ in me. I'm a living sacrifice. I'm dead and yet I live. live. And, and if you want to say it like Paul says it, I through the law died to the law, uh, that I may live unto God. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. So it's, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. I'm crucified, but I live. I live, yet not I, but Christ. That's what a living sacrifice is. And it's a reasonable service of worship means this is a reasonable, a reasoned, a reckoning, a knowledgeable acknowledgement of facts based on gospel truth. All of this is truth centered on the revelation of the death and resurrection of Christ. It's still gospel. Like I said, the meat of the word is not going on to see something else. It's still, it's just a deeper appreciation of the death and resurrection of Christ, which we call the gospel. But the milk of that word is the testimony of the prophets uh, concerning the death and resurrection of Christ, which also includes the glories to come it, 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 regarding the kingdom. But if you don't see those in the light of the gospel, uh, that's just going to read as judgment to you. you know. But it's also the revelation of the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, which is the meat of the word. And so the meat is going on to see more of what it means that Christ was crucified and rose. And I find out that I, were, I died and am risen. And I present myself to him in worship as a burnt offering be, with the fragrance of Christ. And I'm holy and acceptable because of him. And my reasonable service of worship is just to present myself to God in expectation that he is the life in me. But why? Number one, you know, why? Why? <laughs> if nothing is required of me and I'm already pleasing to God, then I don't need to do anything. That is true. However, it's to prove what is the will of God, good, acceptable, and perfect. And then what does he start talking about? The body of Christ. Because the other aspect of the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, is that Christ was made head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's called his fullness in Ephesians 1.23.
And the body is the container for the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints. The body is the container for the spirit who is the pledge, the foretaste, uh, guaranteeing the foretaste of the inheritance and uh, guaranteeing the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The body is where the gifts reside and the flow of the spirit resides. That is where the milk and the honey of the good land is. The, the enjoyment of the Christian life, the pleasure of it, the satisfaction is not necessarily just found alone. It's God's desire to have a fellowship. He is a fellowship, and he invites us into fellowship through the gospel. We write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you that your joy may be full. And you say, well, he wrote those things to that they would believe the gospel. No, that was First John writing to the church who already believed the gospel. And yet they're writing more things concerning the word of life so that the fellowship can flow, so that the joy can be full. And in Ephesians 3, Paul prays that God would strengthen us into the inner man according to the riches of his glory, uh, that Christ would make his home in our heart through faith, uh, that we would be rooted and grounded in love and be able to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. There's, that, those, there's some dimensionality. Of the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that we may be filled unto the fullness of God. What is that? That is the body of Christ built up in the love of Christ as Christ makes his home in our heart to strengthen us to apprehend with the saints and to have the fellowship. Now, unfortunately, because our, we have been conformed to the religious world and our minds have not been renewed and we've not gone on from milk to meat for the most part, fellowship does not sound attractive to most of us because we don't like the saints. And the reason we don't like the saints, we thought was because something's wrong with us. And we condemned ourselves and had to go back to the milk of the word to make sure we were saved. Because, you know, the new commandment is to love, uh, to believe in Jesus Christ and to love one another. And I can't stand these people. Well, what we found as we got back to the milk is we discovered our crown. We, we found out that these in many cases, or most cases, we're not saints, but antichrists and wolves and thieves and robbers and hirelings that had stolen our insurance assurance and beat us. No wonder we didn't like them. But if you get the milk right and you get the testimony right, uh, you will and discover those and start to learn to mark and avoid those who do not have the testimony but contradict and deny it and gather with those and assemble in some way with those who bear the testimony. Don't just assume that somebody has the testimony because they say, oh, I believe that. No, who actually bears the testimony on their lips so that their speaking is God speaking. When you find that, you're going to be brought into a fellowship that brings you joy. And this is the will of God, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Um, so that's what he's talking about. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, prove. See, when you renew your mind, you'll start to prove out God's will. You'll not only just know God's will, you'll actually prove it. Uh, the good acceptable. Now, acceptable here is the same word, I believe, as you presented yourself acceptable to God. It's a pleasing arrangement, not based on you, based on Christ and his arrangement. That is satisfying to both God and you. Uh, the will of God is satisfying. It is not a demand on you that will make you miserable. <laughs> we, we, when we went through Colossians, we talked about that. That he prayed that we would uh, grow in the knowledge of his will. Look at this real quick. For this cause, since the day we heard of it, do not cease praying for you, 
desire that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and spiritual wisdom and understanding, that you may walk worthy unto the Lord, all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance with or of the saints. It's the inheritance singular of the saints. It's all of our inheritance. So, and justification qualified us for that inheritance. Anybody who tells you that the inheritance is one thing and salvation is something else, and justification only qualified you for your salvation, but the inheritance you have to work for, and everybody has their own inheritance, that person is to be marked and avoided. Unless they repent. <laughs> Once you explain to them that this is error. Most people believe it. So you got to give them some space to learn. But once they double down and start railing, mark and avoid. Uh, giving thanks to the Father, which has made us meet or qualified us to partake of the inheritance. Past tense, he qualified us. How? Through justification. Uh, the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us. From the power of darkness, or the authority of darkness, or the kingdom of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now the same people will say, yeah, entering the kingdom is one thing. Justification unto salvation is another. Uh, it's, a, it's a mess. No, I'm already transferred into the kingdom. I've already passed out of darkness into light. And I'm already qualified for a share of the allotted portion. Uh... Now, when do I get that allotted portion and the enjoyment of it? Is it just tomorrow in eternity future in the sweet by and by? No, I could put it on now by renewing. The renewing of my mind. The less I'm conformed to the world and the more I'm renewed in my mind to agree with, number one, God's testimony concerning his son in the prophets, so I know who he is, and I recognize brethren by that testimony. Then I'm brought into the fellowship of the mystery uh and uh okay so he says who delivered us from the power of darkness has translated us into the kingdom of his son in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins okay so the purpose of redemption is to bring you into the enjoyment of the inheritance of the saints with the saints obviously <laughs> uh Okay, and, and again, that causes problems for people who think, oh, well, I've got social disorders and that's why I can't hang out with people, or I've got this and that. No, all that is flesh, and what you have not yet found is the real fellowship. And the reason you haven't found the real fellowship is because you have not gone by the testimony. You've, gone, you've given too many people a pass that didn't actually believe, and we are required to discern. In fact, every epistle is about that. Um, there's, you're either, you know, you're either hanging out with dogs or, or, and wolves or sheep, you know, uh, but this is the body of Christ and that's the will of God. So he says, uh, we present ourselves to God. We're renewed. This is our reasonable service. This is the meat of the word. And the meat of the word is the acknowledgement of the mystery, uh, and the mystery is concerning Christ in you, what his life is doing in you, but that is for the, the fellowship, not just um, being saved, but enjoying your salvation. And I'm sorry, but uh, most of the admonitions in the New Testament, if not all, are related to fellowship. They're not laws and instructions for you to obey so that you can get a trinket or a reward they are all related to the fellowship. Put on the new man is related to the fellowship. It, and how do we put on the new man? Well, it's by renewing. And we put on bowels of affection towards one another. And we don't let wrath come in towards one another. And we recognize the enemy's devices towards the fellowship. But that can only be held where you have a dividing line between what is fellowship and what is not. And if you don't have the testimony of Christ front and center, you're not in the fellowship. You're not enjoying fellowship. It's something else. Um, and so a lot of people are going around saying, oh, well, they're not receiving the brethren and everything. No, we go by the testimony. And it's not man's testimony, it's God's testimony concerning his son. But anyway, as we have 
many members in one body. All members not have the same office. We being many are one body in Christ and every member is one another. So what he's talking about is when you're sober minded and renewed in the spirit of your mind, you're going to see yourself as a member of the body of Christ. You're going to recognize there are differences, but you're going to recognize we're members one of another and we're called to enjoy the allotted portion of the saints in light or the inheritance of the saints in the light. How do we, how do we enjoy it in the light? Well, we walk in the light. And John says it this way, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of sin. Holiness in our living is the result of the washing that comes in the fellowship as we walk in the light of the truth. Holiness in your living is not a matter of law keeping. It is a matter of fellowship. When you present yourself to God as a reasonable service of worship, you're already fellowshipping with him in the truth based on his testimony, all the things that Christ has provided for you. Then when you find the saints who are also gathered in such a way, that are presenting themselves to him and acknowledging that testimony. You'll find that testimony on their lips. When you walk with them, there is a strengthening of the flow and holiness. Uh, there's a washing because the feet are washed. We wash each other's feet. How do we wash each other's feet? Do we beat each other and tell each other to keep the law? No. It, the, the washing is the washing of the water of the word, which renews us in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We talk about Christ. And you can it's becoming so clear who is in and out of the fellowship by what do they say about what we talk about. We testify of Jesus Christ and they say he has an unclean spirit. Well, <laughs> okay, well, what did he say? Well, he acted unbecomingly. Well, what did he say? Well, he said, he said somebody's a dog and said they're not saved. Well, why did he say that? Well, because he's not nice. Well, go back and listen. What did he really say? Oh, they were going from wall to wall, railing against the doctrine of Christ, calling it a license to sin, calling Christ a minister to sin, stumbling babes in Christ, lying about the teachings, allegorizing the Bible, denying the promises, Pointing to experience rather than the doctrine of Christ and running with witches. Oh, well, that was a little different than the way I viewed it. Once you, a lot of people are coming to me realizing, oh, things are not as we thought, you know. Um, but it's just becoming so easy now because we're in the harvest and we're, the tares are being manifested because the testimony is being so clearly spoken by so many. You can't duplicate that. Uh, and there's a fellowship and in that fellowship there is holiness but we don't have to talk about law to have the holiness we just talk about Christ and he is our sanctification they don't believe that they have a form of godliness and deny the power Christ is the power not the law but anyway as we do this uh, we find ourselves more and more hungering and thirsting for the, the body of life which, let's not make it too mystical. All it means is you're looking for others who, who share the same view, you know, and speak the same thing. Now, sometimes you won't find it. What do you do? John on Patmos, Paul in prison. They're alone. Well, you're, they're still members of the body of Christ, and they're still supplied as the body is being built up and becoming stronger in the testimony even if you're alone, you are still benefiting from that supply. You'll still be strengthened inwardly. In a, in a, you know, Paul said, even though I'm absent with you in spirit, uh, flesh, I'm with you in spirit. And uh, he said, this will turn out to my salvation through your petition of the bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Christ is being magnified in my body, whether through life or death. Uh, for me to live is Christ. And then he says... Um, you know, I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. He's not with them, but he's fully enjoying the fellowship. He says, as much as you are uh, uh, laboring with me in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are fellow partakers with me of grace. And I have you in my heart as both uh, 
in, in, and I long for you in the inward parts of Christ. That's a fellowship. Even if you're not physically, it's not about being physically present. It's about where's your heart, you know? My heart is it, with Christ and the church. Not about where I am physically. Uh, so don't let that trip you because we're all virtual here. Sometimes we are. Some people, a guy emailed me yesterday or commented yesterday that his parents, he's, he's I guess in high school, sent him to a strict Calvinist school. And yet he is reveling in grace and getting clear about it. So what's he going to do? He can't get out of that situation. Well, he's like Daniel. He's like, uh, you know, Daniel was priest in the of God, but he was uh, in the den of the wise men of Babylon. I send you as uh, serpents among the, or, I'm sorry, I send you as uh, sheep among the wolves. I told him to be wise as a serpent, keep his mouth shut, don't try to save them, this is their territory, but learn everything you can, because God is going to prepare you against that backdrop. You know, get learn Romans in and out. Uh, you be strong in the Lord. You, you are not alone. Stay and listen to the messages. Stay on the walls. Stay in fellowship. Don't think you have to fight those people. Keep quiet and be wise. Just submit to it. You can't. And trust that God has ordered your steps. You know, he feels very alone, but he's not. Anyway, I'm going to have to go. But let's go back and review real quick. Romans 16, 25. Uh, now to him who's of power to establish you according to my gospel... And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God. So there's the testimony of Christ by the scriptures of the prophets, which gets us saved, and I would say that's like the milk. And then there is the mist, revelation of the mystery, which is Paul's gospel, which is Christ in you. And this new thing called the body of Christ, which is the container for the inheritance. Okay, and we have a foretaste of the inheritance. All of that is Pauline truth. Uh, and we are members one of another. And this body is the circulated, uh, the vessel in which the resurrected life of Christ circulates and flows as a fellowship by the Spirit. And this fellowship is a foretaste of the goodness of God that we will experience in the ages to come is our comforter. And we don't have to be miserable waiting for the rapture to get out of here before the God's fireball burgers hit the earth. No, we are looking for an inheritance and even the prophetic word, that's how we see it. We, our, our eyes are on the prize of gaining Christ, whether now or later. You know, In this age of the ages to come, we count all his loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ to pursue him, to know him in the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Uh, and then Col Colossians, one last thing. He says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and as may have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be comforted, being knit together in love. And unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ. Now, some translations I, uh, say the mystery of God, which is Christ. But it's t clearly talking about, he already just said in verse 26 that he was given a dispensation of the Word of God to complete the Word of God, even the mystery which had been hidden from ages and generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God willed what is to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. Uh, and he says that we may present every man full grown or perfect in Christ. And he says, this is what I labor for. So I'm not laboring just to get people saved. I'm laboring to present them full grown in Christ. Again, when we do this, the evangelists so-called, who are wage slaves come and tell us that we're being lazy and we're not working for a reward and we need to get busy. People are going to die and get judged and go to hell and man, God's mad at them all and you got to save them from God's mad anger. You know, No, we have our eyes on the inheritance, which is Christ himself. And it's by building up the body of Christ that we produce evangelists anyway. 
you know. So, so we build up the body of Christ, and then in the body of Christ, he gives gifts. Um, but Paul's labor was so that the hearts may be comforted. Comforted, not beat down and oppressed. Being knit together in love, so this is corporate, in a fellowship, unto all the riches, those are the riches of Christ, of the understanding, so this is a renewal of the mind, uh, uh, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of Christ. So we have to acknowledge the mystery. It's not something that comes naturally to us. I died with Christ, right. I'm dead, nevertheless I live, yet Christ lives in me. How does that? There's a There are riches behind that truth that need to be unpacked and enjoyed in fellowship until it becomes our life. Uh, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, of Christ, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. And he says, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And then he goes on to talk about, don't let anyone rob you of your assurance and your crown uh, by judging you unworthy of your prize. By saying, you know, the inheritance, no, you got to work for that. The reward, no, you got to work for that. Uh, you, yeah, you're saved, but that just means you're going to heaven when you die. No, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, I'm coming here. I don't know where you're going, but uh, number one. And number two, the Christ is what I inherit, and I've received a foretaste today of the inheritance. And I've been qualified for a share of the inheritance with the saints in the light. And to enjoy that inheritance, I just need to walk in the light and be renewed. And for that, there's a there's a ministry that comforts the hearts. Uh, and someone who labors for it. You know, Paul labored that their hearts would be comforted. We don't need teachers. We got into a new covenant, new heart. Don't need teachers. Don't listen to them people. They don't know what they're talking about. They're not even saved. They're preaching the gospel to themselves. They're not even saved. No. We're saved people who are learning the gospel by the preaching of the prophets first, and that's how we measure whether somebody is in the fellowship or not. Is Do they bear that testimony or do they deny it? First John is about that. But then we go on to the meat of the word, which is the acknowledgement of all the riches unto the full assurance of understanding of the mystery of God, which is Christ. Uh, in you the hope of glory which produces the body which is the fellowship and our hearts are being comforted and uh and we're being knit together in love unto an acknowledgement of this mystery this is the full assurance of understanding and that's the words that hebrews uses too full assurance of faith it's assurance well you don't need that because you're not even saved if you need assurance i know first corinthians 15 1 through 5 i don't know why you keep preaching the gospel to yourself i already know those verses you are an idiot. That's why you're. That's why you. You're an idiot. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and upload this and get my day started. Take care.